Isn't that the truth, honestly? If you just think about the church of today, you look at Christianity today, I'll tell you the church has been diluted, majorly diluted. I think if we're not careful, we can become those type of followers where we're just looking for something that's going to please us, something that's going to suffice us. You know, uh, we're looking for a style versus Jesus. And, and we, we, we have to guard ourselves from that. And I wanted to start off with something funny, right, just to kind of go ahead and uh, allow you to be able to eat the rest of the meal you're going to have today with some joy. But uh, I love this, this, this Christian comedian. He's, he's so good. If you watch all his videos, they're just hilarious. But you know what he's really doing? He's, he's really trying to open the eyes of Christianity. To, this is the reality of the church today. We have literally diluted the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that maybe you or we per se are doing that, but I think it's, it's good for us to pay close attention and to realize that the scripture says that in, in the last days, men's hearts will grow cold. And, and, and it can grow so cold where not even the scripture moves your heart anymore. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't convict you. It doesn't, it doesn't shake off. The, the viper, like Paul, when he's right there, a viper bites him, but he just shook it off. And it's so easy to come to this place of complacency and comfortability where, where now we're just looking for worship centers that, that have all of our favorite flicks. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and God is saying, what, what have we done to the powerful church that I died for? He gave us resurrection power. So uh, I'm doing this series called Reposition. And when I was with Yesenia last week in the hospital and just kind of talking with her, we started just talking God's word. And it was interesting because, you know, it, in our conversation, this word reposition came up. And, uh, and I know she's watching right now. As we were talking about reposition, uh, it was through some scripture conversation we were having. And then she's like, it's kind of like what nurses do for me, Pastor. I said, well, what do you mean? She says, every two hours, the nurse comes into my hospital bed and repositions my body. Because if they don't reposition my body on this bed, then that's when infections can take place. That's when your body starts swelling up. So they constantly have to reposition her. And so this message today, and I told her uh, when I was with her, I said, you know what? I'm going to preach a sermon on reposition because you just inspired you were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I believe that's the word that God is trying to speak to his people today. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to reposition. And, 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 and so I, I really believe when she said that, it just struck a chord in me because I thought to myself, I wonder how many of us have been stuck in the same place. I wonder how many of us may have been paralyzed with fear. Uh, doubt, unbelief, and, and we're not repositioning. Then, then you wonder why we're being infected by the spirit of this world, infected by the lies of the enemy, infected with, with the enemy who comes to water down our faith, to dilute our trust, our belief in Christ Jesus. And it, it, it makes total sense. God is always on the move. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus is, uh, he's invited to this wedding, this wedding feast. And uh, it wasn't just him, him, his disciples, his mom, they were all invited to the wedding. And um, while they were at the wedding, you know, they're just, they're being guests, right? They just want to enjoy, hang out, love on people. And uh, there was a problem that happened at this wedding. And the mom, the mother of Jesus, obviously saw the problem. And she saw that they had ran out of wine. Let me see all my winos in here. Any winos in here? I'm just, no, don't, do, don't lift your hand. They ran out of wine. And, uh, and so Mary's like, you know, uh, what are you going to do about this? And Jesus like, you know, woman, what do I have to do with this? It's not my time. You read that story. It's not my sermon. But um, so then, then, uh, then here's what happens. John chapter 2, verse 9. And we're going to read to verse 10. And this is, we know the story. He turns water into wine. Verse 9. The person in charge tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, but the servants who had brought the water knew. Then the person in charge called the groom to one side. He said, hey, listen, wait a minute. Everyone, ever say everyone. everyone. See, and you don't want to fall into the everyone trap. He says, everyone bring 
brings out the best wine first. They bring out the inferior, everybody say inferior, wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best for now. But you have saved the best for now. How does this relate to me? How does this relate to you? Here's how it relates. If we're not careful, you can start off as a believer giving your best at first. Trusting God with all your heart. Believing God with all your heart. Come on, serving God with all your heart. Following God with all your heart. And it was the best at first. But eventually, you became inferior. You became, I don't know, angry, disgruntled, uh, upset, unsatisfied. Why? Because life hits us. Life happens and then we can become so emotionally stuck, hurt, and even suffering to where we literally stay there for a very long time. And that's how we start diluting our faith. It happens slowly. It's happened to all of us in this room, including Mauricio Ruiz right here of Elevate Church. It's happened to me. So I'm not trying to tell you, oh, look at what you are doing. I'm telling you, hey, let's watch it because we have an adversary, and his name is the devil. And if you don't read your Bible, we can literally be blinded by the reality that the thief does not come except to steal, kill, destroy. But listen, but God will never give Satan all that kind of props. John 10, 10, right? The latter part of that verse, Jesus said, but I have come to give you life and to give you abundant life. That's what God wants to do for us. And so it's easy to water down and dilute our faith. It's so easy to water down and dilute the church as well, just so that we can relate to people, just so that we don't offend people. But how many know that's not, that's not the real church? That's not even the real Jesus. The scriptures should be bringing conviction to our life. The scriptures should be confronting whatever sin is in our life. The scriptures should be empowering us to live for Jesus Christ. The scriptures should be infusing us with Holy Ghost power to go and make a difference. It's not just about come and sit in the service and let's experience the presence of God for a moment. No, how about let's experience the presence of God so that we can have lasting transformation and then we continue this presence of God so that it becomes everlasting so that then we can change the world. See, because I love the fact, that I love the presence of God, okay? The presence of God, it changes my soul. Fine, great, wonderful, good for you. But shouldn't I have enough presence to spill over for someone else? That's what God wants for us. And so it's easy to walk. Well, well look at the word inferior. He said, man, you guys brought out the best, and then you ran out. You can, you can, you can start giving your best, and then you run out of, you run out of juice. Huh? And, and you know how I can relate this, this story to? Sometimes I think we can also water down our Christianity. But look at the word inferior. It means to lower. Come on, you can lower your, your walk with God. It means poor quality. Come on, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. What's the quality of my life? What's the quality of my faith? What's the quality? Because there's a lot of people that proclaim they have faith, but then you look at the fruit, it's like, okay, but you haven't, when was the last time you believed God for something? Right? So the quality starts dropping. So it's poor quality. How about this one? Mediocre. Right? It just becomes, man, life just becomes mediocre. You know, it just kind of, we're, we're barely making it to church. Why just, we feel mediocre. We believe mediocre. We trust mediocre. And sometimes, we can literally water down our faith to where it's not as important as it used to be. It's less important. So he's saying, he's saying right here in the story that, that they left the inferior to finish this race. The inferior to complete this ceremony. But I believe that when you look at the scripture, because see, if you go back, it says, but you have saved the best until now. See, so often we think that the scripture says he saved the best for last, right? We kind of think that sometimes, like, oh, God, God leaves the best for last. No, he saves the best for now. 
for the present tense. Not, not, because he, if, if, if it's, if it's only God saves the best days of your life at the very end of your life, that'll suck. <laughs> like, if you told me, like, Modi said, don't worry about it, in about 20 years, you'll be finally changed. Take me home, Jesus. There's take the wheel, take me home. So he's not saying that he saved the best for last. No, he's saying I saved the best for right now. In other words, right now, God wants to do something incredible in your life. Right now, God wants to heal. Right now, God wants to love. Right now, God wants to make you a, a victor, right? Right now, God wants to give you an experience with him that is lasting but so often, if we're not careful, and I keep saying we're not careful because I believe that the church is not as careful as it used to be. We're talking, I'm talking to the choir, right? It's so easy, even here, as people start filling this place, as, as we have so many services, it's easy to just start preaching sermons that make you feel good because you got itchy ears. And then that's shame on me, right? I love the video. He's saying, there's too much conviction there. I don't like that, you know. It made me feel uncomfortable. The church should be uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable in the presence of God while God is comfortable in your presence. That's the way it should be. So he said, he saved the best for now. God works his best right now. Everybody say it right now. Right now. Today. Today. Say it right now. This present time. And I think that too many people think that the best they can ever be is what they once were. I honestly believe there's a lot of Christians that feel that way. Like we can begin to reminisce when it was good. I remember me and God. Man, man, there was a time when me and God, we were just like, man, we're like two peas in a pod. Man, we were just, we were, we were like, like tortillas with carne asada. It was so good. You know what I'm saying? We were like, we were like the best taco mix. And, and we can start reminiscing like, man, I remember when, when we used to own a house. I remember when, when, when we were able to walk in and, and man, we, we had cars and, and house. And then the economy took a dip and recession came. And then we lost our house. And start reminiscing only about the victories that you once had. It was, it's almost like this. We start having these once upon a time stories, you know, we tell our kids, you know, there was a time when I was happy. There was a time where I did feel fulfilled. But how many know that without God, you'll never be fulfilled. He's the only one that can fulfill you. He's the only one that can fill you up. He's the only one. And so we can begin to reminisce on the time where, man, I remember when, man, we were doing so good financially. Man, when we weren't striking, I can reminisce. And so many people keep living a once upon a time. Because all we do is we remember moments and experiences of a time when it felt good. For example, I'll never forget. I was asking my wife, I'm like, do you remember certain times of your life where you had like a moment that heaven marked you? And so I started thinking that. Like, when did heaven mark me? Like, have you ever asked yourself, like, when did God mark you? When did he touch you? Or how many times has he touched you? When are moments that you can go back and be like, man, I could remember that one time. And how many know that God's a do it again God? So, okay. so, so I remember, I have, I have a few, but there were only like maybe three major moments. And I remember when I first came to Christ, I was just so hungry for God. I just wanted, I wanted, I wanted his presence every single day. Not that I don't want it now, but I wanted to know him deeper. Like I wanted to know him, know him. Intimacy. Into me, see God, and I can see in you. Amen. And so I remember being at a Benny Hinn crusade. Y'all remember the Benny Hinn crusades? This is like back in the days where stadiums would be packed with thousands and thousands of people. And I got a hold of some tickets. And I was like, yes, I get to see Benny Hinn in his white suit. I was like, yes, it's going to be awesome, you know. And, and let me tell you something. His ministry is awesome. He is, he's legit. Listen, everybody can point the finger at anybody. So let's not be so quick to throw stones, amen. So anyway, so I remember my seat was at the nosebleed of the nosebleed. 
like it was like first tier, second tier, third tier, and then you have tears. I was in the tears zone, like crying, like, oh, my God, I wish. And I was like, man, I want to I wanna be in the second floor. You know, I want to be down. I want to I wanna get closer, but that's okay. Because how many know that God is just looking for someone to be like Mary and look in Jesus and say, do something. And so I'm like, okay, well, I happened to go outside to like where they have the concession stands. I saw a friend of mine. My friend's like, hey, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, man, I'm right here. I'm, I'm at the crusade. I'm enjoying it. He's like, hey, I got seats in the second, uh, the second tier. You want, you want some? Dude, are you kidding me? I told everybody, I'll see you later, and I went to the second floor, man. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know you anymore. I'm on the second floor now. And it was, I was like, wow. But then, check this out. Then I'm, I'm going back down because I want to just, you know, it's before conference. I got there super early. So now I'm on the bottom floor just to feel it like, wow. Like this is the bottom tier. Like this is where it happens. <laughs> this guy approaches me, okay, an employee, a staff member of Benny Hinn. He says, you, come here. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. He's like, he's like, I'm like <laughs> now, now I'm going past leaders and pastors like, yes, right. And my walk was changing as I was walking. Really like, That's right, yeah. That's staff member, yeah. And he says, sit right here. I'm like, so third row. Third row to the spit zone. I sat. And I forgot everybody. <laughs> I didn't bring anybody with me. They all stayed up there. But I'm like, man, this is my moment. But I'll never forget it because, you know what, sometimes you can be in a place in your life where you feel like you're in the tear zone, where you're in the pain zone, when you're so far up there. But God is able to move you when you're willing to reposition yourself. All I wanted was to be at the ground in the presence of Almighty God. Yes, the anointing was on that man. Yes, but I wanted more of Jesus. Amen. It was never about the man. It was about I just want, I'm willing, God, to do whatever move I need to make just to get closer to you. Oh, it gets better. <laughs> then Benny Hinn calls me up on stage, and he lays hands on me, and I was out for the count. I'm like, someone please give me a cover because I'm going to stay up here. So from the tears to the stage, God can do that for you. But when you're diluted, but when you just want church the way you want it, it's not going to work. You'll be the most bored Christian. Listen, we have to be careful with boredom in Christianity. Boredom always leads to sin. It's just the reality. And so I believe that right now we can have the greatest revivals. You know, I've been hearing for 23 years as a Christian, you know, by my pastor, pastor's pastor, leaders, and everyone. I love them all, and I believe like them too, but, but I, I kind of started realizing something. I kept hearing revivals coming, revivals coming. Well, dang, I've been waiting for 23 years. I have yet to see revival. But you know what I've learned in my 23 years of walking with God? That revival has already come 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, I no longer leave you an orphan. I leave you a helper and he's the Holy Spirit. And you will turn the world upside down because of my power. He says, you will have power to be my witness. And I have realized that, yeah, no, for 23 years I have not seen a corporate revival. But in 23 years I have seen personal revivals. That means me and God walking into hospital rooms. That means me and God getting together with people that are struggling, that are hurting, and praying with them. I have seen revivals where I've been in coffee shops, restaurants, and we're praying for different people. I've seen revivals of situations where, man, they have literally looked like impossible. I've seen people, I've seen revival of people that were already on their deathbed come back to life. So it's not about waiting, because see, that's the problem. We're waiting and waiting. We're waiting for healing. We're waiting for victory. We're waiting for breakthrough. No, 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 no. Listen, you decide when you reposition. You decide when you're ready for change. You decide when you're ready for that next level. That's your choice, amen? But, but, but you have to partner with God, right, because he's a revivalist. Think about it. How do you think Jesus came out of that tomb? Holy Spirit. Who raised him from the dead? Holy Spirit. I'm not tricking you guys. Who, who raised him from the dead? Oh, oh Jesus. 23 years, I'm telling you. 
It's only been personal revival. Do you still have a personal revival? What are you and God doing? How are you turning the world upside up? Because it's upside down right now. What are you doing? How many coworkers have you literally impacted? Or are you a secret service Christian? Where you keep it on the low down? Because you don't want to offend anyone's beliefs. Are you kidding me? The world is unashamed. So if the world is unashamed of what they believe, what is wrong with the church? What do you mean? I, 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 I want to be sensitive. You know, I don't want to hurt anyone. I want to be respectful of other people's religion. That's the problem. You're living religion. Because a relationship, you tell everybody about it. Right? When you get hooked up, linked up, when you're married, when you got your girlfriend, man, you're all excited telling everybody, how is it that we put Jesus in a box? How is it that he's not real to us? How is it that he's not worthy of sharing with someone who's hurting and broken? Come on, God wants to turn your workplace from water to wine. That's what he wants. Okay, the word reposition, very simple. It means to change position. That's all it means. Just to change position. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of laying a foundation because the next two weekends I'm going to continue this series. But... Maybe you need to change the position of the way you think, right? Maybe your point of view is, is obstructed. Maybe you need to change your position in your belief system. Maybe you need to change the position of your behavior. Maybe you need to change the position of your character. Maybe you need to change the position of your integrity. Aren't you glad that God allows us to reposition? It's called redemption. In other words, you don't have to live once upon a time. You can go ahead and begin to receive God's redemption, God's redeeming power, and not keep saying, I remember the times or once upon a time. But you can actually right now begin, right now, to start new experiences with God. Right this moment. Say right now. Now, let me explain this. Why did Mary ask Jesus for more wine? Was she a wino? I don't know. I don't know. It's a great question. It's just a question. Don't get offended at me, all right? Don't send me emails, especially if you're Catholic, all right? I come from Catholic background. All right, don't, don't, don't go there. Don't do that to me. But, but ask yourself, why would she? This is a good question. Why would she ask for more wine? Why? If you want to be, you know, someone that wants to confront Scripture, God, God loves this. I ask questions like that, you know? Um, and I could only think of this. This is my own, um, this isn't thus saith the Lord. This is, you know, this is what I feel like I got out of the word. Um, when you think about the ancient weddings of Israel, okay, of the Jewish tradition, when you got married, it, you know, for us, when we get married, right, for those that are married, your party is like maybe just a few hours, right, a couple hours, maybe five hours max. I don't know. Back in those days, it was seven days. Seven days. No sleep. <laughs> so just like, if it was just like, you know, don't, don't, I mean, you better have been, you had to have your dance on. It was a seven-day feast. Now let's bring it back spiritually, okay? Think about this. Seven-day, it was a seven-day feast. Mary, Mary the mother of God, okay? Pure woman, holy woman. She's looking at a couple. She's looking at a feast. She's looking at a, at a covenant that God has established. She's looking at righteousness, and she looks at her son, and she says, do something. Why? Because the wine had ran out, but the seven days weren't completed. How does that apply to me? Listen, you and I, we have a number of years to live, and God wants to complete them with a great feast. God wants to do something incredible. So many of us, we're just thinking, this is it. Oh my God, this is the rest of my life. Well, they can be if that's what you desire. Or you can start saying, no, my life is a feast. And the Father cared. Why would he put this scripture? Why would, why would this context of, of scriptures be in the Bible to, to, to reveal to us 
how he views us. Doesn't he call us the bride and he's the groom? Yes, he cares about you. That's right. So Mary's like, oh, no, man, this feast is going to have a blast. And so she looks at Jesus and said, do, do something. You got to turn some water into, you got to do something. So let's back up to John chapter 2. Now let's go to verse 5 and 8 quickly. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Is that verse okay? Say it with me. Whatever he says to you. What if we just started doing that? Whatever he says to you. Okay, y'all too silent. Whatever he says to you. See, Nike didn't get that. God did. I think we would be so much further if we just did what he said. I think our healing would break forth faster if we just did what he said. I think our family could be further if we just did what he said. I think anything we put our hands to can be so much further if we just do what he says. The greatest challenge is doing what he said. How many agree with me on that? It's easier to read it like, uh, okay, I'm not feeling that. Why? Because we're a feely generation, right? And so we want to feel our way through life. God didn't say have feelings. He said have faith. And so it says do whatever he says to you. Verse 6, now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification. So when you got married in the seven-day feast, there was a process of marriage. There was a process of how a feast would be handled, just like your life. You and I, we go through life, but God also has a process of healing. He has a process of victory. He has a process of personal growth. He has a process for us as well that we have to cooperate with. And so there's a custom here that Jesus is willing to respect, but then he starts moving some people around. It says, so there's six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons a piece. Man, these people could drink, huh? Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said, fill the water pots with what? Water. So were the pots empty? Yes. What does that tell me? There are times where Mauricio feels empty. There are times where I feel completely drained, empty. And if anyone here says, well, I don't feel empty, you a liar. We all hit those empty places. And the only one who can fill us back up is God. See, we're always looking for a sermon, an encouraging something, book, whatever to fill. Listen, no one can fulfill you and no one can fill you like God. A person can't fill you. A thing can't fill you. Nothing can. It can, it can give you temporary pleasure. It can give you temporary band-aid. But it's not going to heal you, it's not going to fulfill you, and it's definitely not going to fill you. And so here we see that they had all these, and he says, fill them up with water. And they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, now draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. In other words, God is saying right here, he's saying, reposition yourselves, and I will refill you with my best now. That's what I believe God's saying to us. Think about it. Jesus is also repositioning his disciples. They went from guests to miracle workers. Jesus didn't lift a hand. Mary said, do what he says. Okay. So all the disciples were like, okay, yes. And he said, okay, go and grab a whole bunch of water and fill all those pots. They're, they're right there. Just can you imagine how many times they had to go back to the well? Okay. Because it wasn't like us. You're probably thinking you're sink. Like, okay, No. They had to walk miles to a well. Some of us won't even go the extra mile for anybody. You know what I'm saying? They got to go miles. Can you imagine how many? Twelve disciples just, just, you know, everybody running with their buckets, you know, filling it up, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's through that process that a lot of Christians get tired. Because you just want the miracle, but you don't want to be a part of it. Yeah, he's your ATM guy. Do this now. Do, do, do. Four buns. God's like, no. No, we're, we're in partnership. We do miracles together. 
So they went from guests to miracle workers with Jesus. They had to reposition themselves. They had to roll up their sleeves. And they had to go to work. And it was that work. It was that do what he says that got them that big miracle. Turning water into wine. And I love that because I really believe that, you know, so many of us sometimes, you know, we can be someone that's always worried. But God wants to turn your worry and make you a warrior for him, a warrior, a warrior for his kingdom. Sometimes we feel like victims too long. And I get it. Everybody has, you know, the time of grieving. Everyone has a time of sorrow. Everyone has a time of whatever you're going through. But you can't be a victim forever. Even when, uh, when women and children are rescued from sex trafficking, you know what the process of their healing is? Is to take them from victim to victor. You hear what I'm saying? So, so God, God wants to turn our water into wine. He wants to do something beautiful. But they had to do exactly what he said. Look what they had to do. They had to, in order to see that miracle, they had to, number one, they had, to, they had to be a part of the miracle. Number two, they had to experience the victory, right? And they got to watch the completion of a seven-day feast. I love that, that God wants to see the completion of your life. God wants, listen, not, not, not the best. Come on, he saves the best for last. We, so we start thinking one day, someday, someday in the future, one, one, day, one day I'll be able to have. God's like, come on, man. I'm a now God. We, we, have, to, we, have, to, we have to watch it. We, we have to see our life is not in fear. It's not less than to God. It's not less important to God. It's, it's not mediocre to God. Your life matters. Look at your neighbor and say, you matter. Oh, God wants to have the greatest move of God's now. The greatest encounters of God now. God wants to take you from the tear zone to the stage, to his presence. Amen. That's what God wants to do for all of us. But the enemy wants to do what? He keeps us distracted from believing him. He keeps us distracted from trusting him. The devil will keep us distracted from ever repositioning ourselves. Why? Because the enemy will tell you how difficult it is to get there. The enemy will tell you you're not getting better. The enemy will tell you it's not going to get better. The enemy will tell you this is where you're going to lay the rest of your life. And those, those, these, these are real enemies. You can still say devil in church, by the way. It's not, it's not popular to say devil. No, seriously. In churches, they refer it as an enemy. But human nature, we, ref, we reference enemy as people. People are our enemies. God's like, You're, you've already got broken theology. See, there's a devil, an adversary who hates you, who can't stand you. We have to know the nature of our enemy in order for us to have a strategy from heaven. If you don't know the nature and understand your enemy, you got no strategy. But when you understand the nature and the strategy of your enemy, let me tell you something. You will know how to combat. You'll know how to fight the good fight of faith. You'll know how to go from being a victim to a victor. Why? Because you already know that my victory is found in Jesus Christ. But when you don't know your enemy, when you don't know who that enemy is, you will blame people the rest of your life. And that, that just that hurts you. Now I get it. Satan will influence people to do a lot of evil things but you got to know the source of it and we have three enemies that we got to that keep us from change you guys ready number one quickly the world let me say the world the world world is going to oppose your values that's an enemy isn't it number two ever say the flesh flesh. that's your carne your meat your flesh you okay it's the patterns that oppose your repositioning and we all have a pattern Everybody here has a pattern. And number three, ever say, the devil. The devil. It's, it's not a cuss word. It's a real thing, right? Okay. And the devil, he's the principality. He's the power. 
or he is the forecast that opposes your reposition. He will, isn't it funny how the devil, man, any time that Jesus said, let's go to the side, it's almost like clockwork, saying, whipped up a storm. Like clockwork. Let's go to the other side. Storm like crazy. You guys remember that story, right? You got to know that Satan is always thrown out a forecast to you. Like some of you this morning, maybe you had a big fight at home. Man, the devil threw a forecast to you. And, and see, but God also has a forecast for us. But sometimes we put more faith in the forecast of the enemy, the lies of the enemy, that we never experience the forecast of God's blessing. What do I mean by that? Pastor Anthony and I, we went fishing on Friday. We actually took a day off. Yes. We haven't done that forever. We went fishing. It was Friday. The winds, we didn't know kind of, you remember how fast the wind, they are like 40, 60, 70 mile an hour winds, right? Remember that? So we're like, hey, let's go fishing. Like, All right, let's go fishing. Yeah, let's do it. So he goes ahead. He gets to the gas station where we buy our stuff. He said, hey, the gas people, gas station lady said we can't fish today. I'm like, what? what? What do you mean? Why we can't fish? He's like, oh, because the winds, like you can't fish on a windy day. I'm like, oh, my God, we didn't even think the winds. <laughs> you know that, you know, because you can't fish on a windy day. You just don't fish. And then, you know, we're like, we ain't going to tell We're going to go fish. So we start driving down the hill, and, and we start, I, I told Pastor, I'm like, we're going to pray, man, that God, because here's what here's the, and I told him this, and he's right here to say yes or no. I said, you know what, God said that we are to, we are to speak to the winds and the waves. And so we're going to speak to these winds and these waves. And we both started praying. And we said, waves, winds, you will stop in the name of Jesus. We're going to have the most amazing day. It's going to be, we, I think we even prayed for, for glass water. And we just started praying just for, and let me tell you something. When we reached the rocks, nothing changed. It's amazing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing changed. When nothing changes in your life, we are quick to give up. We are quick to quit. When nothing, it's been 30 minutes in. We're still, we're tying it up. Hey, you got any heavier weights? Yeah, I'm putting two on. All right, man, I'm going to put two on. I'm going to put a rock at the end of this line. <laughs> but we're, we're going to fish. And let me tell you something. How many minutes was it? 30, 40? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, the winds, and we were praying, praying over the fires to stop. We're just praying everything. We're not going to let a fire stop us. We're not going to let wind stop us. We're not going to let waves stop us. And now I thought, I'm like, why won't, I even thought, like, why didn't we think waves, I mean, winds, huh? Like, duh, that's like the duff you're a fisherman. You don't fish on a windy day. See, here's the thing. We were so consumed with going to fish that we forgot about the winds. God says, I want you to be so consumed with me that you'll forget all your pain. I want you to be so consumed with me that you won't think about what you don't have. You'll know that I'm all that you need. I'm more than enough. I'm more than a conqueror. Amen. When you start seeing Jesus like that, without you even, you won't even, like, why am I happy, man? I can't even pay the bills right now. What the? Man, I was singing today. But, you know, doing my thing. Like, why isn't that bothering me? Because you know that your eyes are fixed on everlasting God. Amen. And it's not easy to do when you're in the storm. It's not easy to do when the winds are blowing. It's not easy to do when the waves are hitting. But if you just fix your eyes on Jesus, Jesus is about to turn your water into wine. I'm telling you, it's possible. Here's the best part. You know what the best part was? Not only did the, did the winds and waves stop, we were tripping. We're like, God, you are so awesome. You love us. You guys should thank us because we literally stopped the winds on Friday. We did. You better thank us. You better say thank you, Pastor, Pastor Anthony. We did. We stopped it for you. I believe that. Why wouldn't I believe that? I was there. Were you there? Why? Because God is saying, I am leaving the best for now. We needed a now moment. Not a future fishing date. We wanted it now. Right now. We caught more fish than we knew what to do with. We caught more fish than on a perfect fishing day. 
I took a picture of, of, the, of the water. The water didn't even move. It, it's, it looked like a mirror. It was, we were like, oh my God, you're so awesome, God. My God, you, you're, you're, you're amazing, God. See, I'll end it there. I'm out of time. So often you see it, but don't reposition it. It's easier to quit. It's easier to run. It's easier to keep the same attitude. It's easier to be negative. It's easier to complain. It's so much easier. Why? There's no effort in that. And listen, when you do that, you have to realize that you're forecasting your own life. The devil has already forecasted. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. But God has trumped his overcast and said, but I have come <laughs> to give you life and life more abundantly. That's what I do. That's what God says. Like, I, I'm greater, I'm bigger than your challenge. I'm greater than your circumstance. I go deeper in relationship. We got to reposition. It's, your, it's on you. You either want to keep having the whole make me feel good type of gospel. looking for style or you can reposition yourself and have a new encounter with God and say I want to know you Jesus now it's up to you you can blame it on the church you can blame it on the leaders you can blame it on everybody you want your mother, your father, your grandmother your, your kid, you can blame it on everybody you want let me tell you, you have to come to a point in your life where you do what Mary said. Whatever he says, do it. I believe that we can have the best families now. That we can have the best songs written now. That we can have the best children now. That we can have the best economy in our, in our family, in our life now. That we can have the best church now. That we can have the best followers of Jesus Christ now now, that we can have the best health of our life right now, that we can have the best of whatever it is that God wants to do, his purpose, his plan, his destiny, right now, right now, not just wait, but God's just looking for his people, bow your head, close your eyes, Father, thank you so much, thank you for your love, thank you for speaking to our hearts today to reposition ourselves, and to realize that that we are a part of your miracles. We are a part of your breakthroughs. We are a part of the victory. And so, Lord, I pray today as we all lift our hands. Everybody lift your hand. Father, as we all lift our hands to you. Lord, we surrender to you, Father. We surrender to your truth. We surrender to your love. We surrender to your plan, God. Your plans for me is to prosper me, to give me a future with hope. And so, Lord, as you see our hands up, we're saying, yes, Lord. We're ready to reposition. We're ready to partner. We're ready to have another encounter, another experience now. Not a once upon a time. No, now. Now. More faith. Now. More love. Now. More forgiveness. Now. Now. More of the Holy Spirit in our life. Pray all this in Jesus' name.